you know, whenever you think of any space, whether it's a meeting room or a gymnasium or a field house or, or any, I mean, we always think, you know, bu bu buildings can be so multi-use, uh, and I'll coin this little phrase, that they become multi-useless, right? They, they, they aren't doing anything optimally. They're, they're doing everything partially well. And it's driven by things like flooring choices and acoustics and, you know, all the things that is their queuing space and their adequate storage to adapt a meeting room to an aerobic studio or to have a gym convert from a basketball program to a pickleball program. And so, you know, to me, it's not only just understanding how to make something multi-use, it's understanding how can you then make it sort of this seamless transition. Um, and I think the key to that is, is having a designer that understands, all right, Let's put a matrix together and let's line up all the activities and let's put down their specific requirements. And then let's try to figure out what are those trigger points to say, all right, this room's just doing too much. We need to either duplicate it, replicate it, or offload that activity to another part of the building. First, I want to thank all of our viewers for tuning in to this roundtable discussion. Uh, we'll be discussing design considerations for indoor youth and amateur sports facilities. And we'll touch on design impacts to participants, to spectators, revenue, operations, safety, and more. Uh, you'll be hearing from some of the top architects in the field, as well as operators and consultants. So I want to thank all my panelists for, for being here as well. I'll do a quick round of introductions. First, we have Tom Chuparkoff from O Sports. He's the director of O Sports, a division of Osborne Engineering Company. Um, they provide architectural planning design services, and he's served in many roles with many companies such as AK HKS, Disney, Populous, O Sports, and a variety of different projects. Um, we have John Sparks, who's an account executive with Sports Facility Advisory and Sports Facility Companies. John has led operations and has been a part of many facilities across the U.S., such as the Phillips Arena, the AT&T Center, the Hoobat Complex, and currently leads the operations of many of the facilities of our sports facilities companies. We have Chris Kostelik, who's the Senior Vice President and Principal for Perkins & Will. He provides architectural and planning design services involved in many community and recreation projects across the U.S. for the past 25 years. And I'm Jake Whitaker. I'm the Vice President of Venue Planning at the Sports Facilities Companies. Uh, and I have 15 years of experience in manufacturing, consulting, um, and contracting in the sports facilities across the U.S. Great. Okay, well, let's start with how most people experience the facilities um, and really what's, what should be considered when spectators, participants, and guests, when you think about the sense of arrival of a facility. Yeah, um, it's, it's really important. You know, I think that when we, when we look at facilities and when we're plotting them and, and doing the site planning exercise, you know, these type of environments are community assets. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, we, we talk about safety and making sure that, you know, vehicular traffic and pedestrian traffic are ca carefully calculated and coordinated. Um, you know, these, these facilities often, and if they're successful, have a lot of activity, interior and exteriorly speaking. So I think that, you know, just being really cognizant about how people get into the complex um, from a vehicular standpoint is probably, you know, the first thing that we really, really try to focus in on. I think, I think there's this whole idea of what we call the third place, right? This idea that this isn't your home, this isn't your office, this may be a building you only visit once, or maybe a building that you come to on a regular weekly basis with a league or a, or a, or a program. And so just recognizing that, it, you know, it, it needs to have good, clear wayfinding. You need to be able to understand where things are at. It's, it's sort of thoughtfully organized. It'll be easier to navigate. Um, should have, you know, sort of quality gathering and social spaces that view onto the activities. Um, but ultimately, it's just about creating something that's authentic and genuine to a particular community so that people are going to want to come back and visit and use it. Because if it's a positive experience, you can expect them to come pay to, pay to visit again. And if it's a negative experience, they may find another community facility to visit in another town. So, John, living in many of these facilities, what are some of the things that you look at, you know, from the sense of arrival and what makes a facility great? Well, uh, both gentlemen have, have expressed very much what dovetails into the guest experience. And the guest experience starts before you hit the front door. So understanding the, the flow path from an interstate to a building through a, a neighborhood and, and how people park 
and how people get to their cars and out of their cars. And, you know, all that lends to the guest experience. It all lends also to the sellability to a rights holder. Um, you know, if, if there is a means to take a charge for parking and there's a proper ingress and the proper egress, then all that makes sense. But if it's not, then it doesn't make sense because it would hamper the guest experience versus help it. So I think that, you know, what that thought process makes good buildings great. Um, I think that you are right, is that we get one shot at the apple, especially with a new customer. And so you have to have what that community sees as a wow factor to them. It's different. What's a wow factor in Atlanta might be different than a wow factor in, in Texas. And, and so, you know, you have to grab a hold of that with the client and understand what their expectations and what their real true desires are and to accomplish out of the building. And then expand upon that, not only design-wise, but then dovetail that into operations. John, and, and it's important, I would bet, I mean, it's got to be consistent, right? Because you, yeah. you, we're talking about guests, but I've always been an advocate. Like, it's not always about the guests. It's about your employees also. And it's about oh, yeah. the people who operate the building. And, you know, it's, it's, you want them to be excited about coming to work and operating and taking pride in that. And I, I think mm -hmm. it's really important. Um, yeah. That we don't we don't limit the word guest to the person who maybe you know spending that one day in the, the venue. Well, I, I I agree hundred percent. Is that you know the the definition of guest and client encompasses a lot of different people. Yeah, and 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 all of their all their needs. You know, you can create a dream that the operations guy lives as a nightmare. Okay, <laughs> and so um, you know uh, we want to we want to definitely try to blend the best together. You know, um, so that we get the max amount of efficiency and, you know, uh, goal in uh, goals at the, at the end of the day. Yeah, those are gr great points. And I know sometimes we consider a lot of times, not, not only the, the spectators, but sometimes for some facilities, there's a need for a separate entrance for officials or a separate entrance for athletes. Um, all considerations, I think, when you think about the sense of arrival is making sure we consider everybody who's arriving and the different experience that they might have. Where I know we look also when we look thinking about sports facilities, there's obviously the surfaces and the playing area, but there's also a lot of amenities involved in, in the project. So I'm curious on what some of the amenities and different elements outside of the playing surfaces that are being considered in the design of the facilities. Uh, so Chris, why don't you uh, give us your thoughts on what, what amenities you see? That's an interesting question because I mean, your immediate reaction is look, there's sort of the standard anchors, right? That, that fall into almost every facility when you start thinking of, you know, the large sort of workhorse spaces like gymnasiums or to field houses or even aquatics. Um, but, but I think it's the extras. I think it's these, these things that sort of maybe fill in the gaps between those big, those big sort of workhorse type spaces. And really, I think the only way to understand that is really kind of put your ear to the ground in a community and understand what, what drives their needs. So, you know, what's going to serve the broadest sector of the community? What's going to make this unique to this particular facility versus what may be down the road or into a neighboring town and really, a, a, you know, sort of impact that, that particular group. So, you know, it's asking those questions. If it's something in the Midwest with cool weather, you know, you're going to see indoor aquatics become high on the list. If you're in a community that has big needs for team sports, you're going to probably see indoor field houses as being pretty, pretty critical. And, and frankly, most communities, I think, tend to look to those amenities that are not available in the private sector or aren't profitable in the private sector to sort of fill in those gaps. And that might be youth enrichment and, and, and community programs, maybe even you know senior programs. You can't underestimate the power of pickleball. Um, but I would just say it's really kind of understanding kind of what is going to drive the most use in a community and then understand what those, and we've had communities that say, you know, we want a shooting range in the basement or we want to, you know, an, an indoor bowling alley because that's popular in a resort community. Um, so I think it's just understanding that and then, and then really kind of driving home the idea that, you know, the more people we can bring through the door, to John's point, the more, the more it affects the bottom line. So just thinking about how you serve that broadest sector of the community through through those types of amenities. You know, I mean, we're talking when we think about sports venues and recreation centers and those kind of things. It's you know, we talk about field of play a lot, but you know, I think a lot of a lot of assets. I mean, you know, we're we're obviously working with you all on a project up north that's got you know the family entertainment area in it. Um, you know, we we completed the, the the project that's got a little ninja warrior course. I mean, there's all kinds of different nuances, but I'd also like you know with the rise of esports and technology. I mean. You know, a lot of these venues provide, you know, a, a, a organization or a neighborhood or, you know, the inner city is an opportunity 
you know, to come to these venues to do stuff that they don't necessarily have at, you know, readily available at their home. Like, you know, like, you know, like to play esports or have the infrastructure and the data and the technology and the computers. So I think, you know, a, a lot of that should be considered as well. I mean, to, to Chris's point, you know, you, you really got to kind of ascertain what the community really needs. And, and it shouldn't, it's not always about, you know, football, soccer, and pickleball. Um, and, and I completely agree that pickleball is, uh, it's, it's amazing how many times we read an RP or whatnot and it's, it's got pickleball and it, it's like, okay, let's do this. And, uh, um, but it, it, it goes outside of the traditional sport also. Right. So I think that, you know, just making sure that there's places where, you know, mom, dad, brother, and sister can all go and, you know, support and, and have something to do that's, that's meaningful and educational is, uh, is really critical. You, you brought a, you, you mentioned a term that we, we always kind of, talk about a lot not to dwell on this too much but this idea of separating need from want mm -hmm. you know there's a you know we don't need a lot I and mean, there are certain things that we we need to sort of get through our, our our daily lives but this idea of understanding what a want is versus a need understanding what benefit you derive from the money you invest and sort of trying to focus on that sort of value driven versus saying well we need a 50 meter pool and we need a you know a 10 core gym no you, you don't need those things but you you assign value to those things and then you find a way to to sort of accomplish what you're trying to accomplish i think that's a, a key piece of it john what do you see in the facilities that that really either enhance an experience or can can cause an issue with the experience of a guest or an athlete in a facility well, I think a strategic look at, at how the flow of a building is going to be, um, where food and beverage is, where people access the court. If you're designing a hockey rink, knowing that, you know, hundreds of players may be coming in with big old bags and do they have to drop the bag in the entranceway? Does it clutter the entranceway? Does it clutter, you know, flow pass? All that stuff, it, it needs to be very well thought out of what the intended use is because both these gentlemen just spoke about you know, understanding the difference between the wants, needs, and desires. And I, and I think that's imperative because it may not always drive the bottom line. It may be what's best for the community. And so, um, you know, which is a different model. And we see that every day in some of the things that we do. But I think that, you know, flow of a building is imperative. Easy access, you know, pe you know, rights holders and promoters and things of that. I learned in the concert business years ago, was that the easier it is for them to come in, take it out of the truck and put it back in the truck and do their thing, then the happier they are. It doesn't make a difference whether you gave them a great business deal or you didn't give them a great business deal. It was how easy was it for them to do their thing. The same applies in youth sports. Okay, how easy for is it, you know, how, how do you have coaches rooms? Do you have referee rooms? Do you have a tournament director room? Do you have those things that make their job easy in executing a great tournament? And so I think, the ease of doing things. The negatives, you know, I think that when we look at design, we're always looking at something that blends into the community and what the community wants as a style, as a, you know, a, a, that best represents them. But, you know, some of the things is, that are very, very important to me are we play basketball or volleyball on a Sunday afternoon at two o'clock. If the glazing is not designed properly and the reflectiveness off the court doesn't hit properly, then now you have people that have a hard time playing. And when you get to when you get above the, the little kids and you get into high school level or very, very competitive showcases, you know, them not being able to see the ball right, them getting a glare off the court, all those things negatively impact the experience. And so, you know, alternative means of not altering the overall outward design, but maybe having curtains or maybe having reflective glass or something of that nature all need to factor into the ultimate design. Um, but I think the biggest thing from a positive or negative standpoint could be the flow within a building. Those are critical components, but, you know, I would add another layer about privacy and encouragement. You know, I always talk about these facilities, you know, with, with the, with the inclusion of, you know, a medical partner or a physical training, or, you know, those, those kind of those three tier type of relationships, you know, these facilities also want to be private a little bit too, right? An athlete may or may not want other people to know that he or she is rehabbing or training or, you know, or, or he or she had a significant injury and, you know, they're, they're kind of bent out, bent out of shape about, about it. And, you know, that procession of coming off the street, leaving your home, coming to the facility should be encouraging. And the access for those entities should probably have some sort of separation potentially, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, a, a careful choreographed connection inside the facility. So as a person is training privately, if he or she chooses to do so, you know, there is still a, a visible connection to the facility for to encourage that athlete to consider, you know, to contribute to their training and, and rehab configurement. So I think, you know, those things can negatively and positively affect the facilities as well. One of the things that we find that, you know, is always forgotten and probably preaching to the choir to this group is, is this idea of purposeful storage to just, you know, we always say, you know, storage equals programming. And the more you can sort of adapt and store, the more you can do. So often, instead of just taking it chance you know design it say okay where does this lift park in charge where does the floor scribble go where how many racks do you need don't don't guess at it draw it you know and so i think those are the things that you know same holds for back of house don't just assume that the loading is convenient for users figure out make sure it's convenient for three or four box trucks to pull up at the same time and unload what they need to and so you know purposeful back of house and i would say and i think one of the things from an op operator's experience also sort of drives the user experience i detest hallways i hate them with a passion buildings shouldn't be organized as a labyrinth of hallways that just shows poor planning yeah. you know it should be large grand useful spaces that feed your 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 amenities and frankly those spaces could be purposeful all of a sudden a large gathering lounge space becomes a community event space it becomes rental space and so as soon as i walk into a sports facility that's littered with hallways i i can almost guarantee it was not very thoughtfully planned and it could have had more square footage attributed to a big grand central hall or a central courtyard or something that allowed it to be more um you know more of a positive experience for the for the users couldn't, couldn't agree more on, on that aspect is that you know those the, one of the keys is the versatility of a space whether it's small or large and hallways just don't lend itself to that okay and great so, for storing stuff in <laughs> right and so, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree more. If it's double the size or it's an open environment, now, now you have the flexibility to make it 10 things versus one thing. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I appreciate that for sure. Absolutely. I think the storage is a great point. It's one of those things that, that we spend a lot of time making sure we get right sized. You know, overdoing it doesn't generate revenue, but obviously it can really affect the operations of, of a facility. So I'm curious about hearing from this group, what are some of the other back of house or operational things that are that are being considered in the design of a facility? Well, I, I mean, I think the storage, we're, we're, most operators are, are pretty attuned to the fact that, you know, you're not going to get I don't, I don't know that I've ever been involved at, at, at the pro level or downward um, with a space that had the right amount of storage. Okay. Storage doesn't lend itself to revenue. So, you know, but it, you need to be right sized as we talk about all the time, Jake, to, to cover, you know, and then be creative enough in how we utilize that space, but modular type racking systems and things that we can, you know, maximize a given piece of square footage, um, you know, more, Space to stack versus more space to be longitudinal um, is always better. Um, you know, I think that uh, maintaining a, a movement of furniture, movement of courts, movement of things that drop from the ceiling versus posts in the court, things all, all those things lessen storage. You know, so you know, not to yield myself to one design or another, but it, wherever possible, if volleyball nets come down from the ceiling it's better than putting holes in the, in the, in the floor, because you got to, you got to store that stuff when you take it out of the floor and, and here, all you got to do is raise it up out of your way and, and you're done. So it, it lends to an efficiency level that, um, that one, one helps the other. So you can make more usable revenue generating space. If you think about what, you know, you're doing within the space and making it as utilizing technology to your advantage. Right. And, and you're attributing that to your staff, right? I mean, you're, you're, you, you understand the limitations of what your staff can accomplish, but at the same time, you also have to calculate in, look, if I've got to pay four people to stack this court and haul it into a staff, you know, into a storage area, I just, I just, that just cost me X amount of dollars on a weekly basis, as opposed yep. to pushing a button. And, and so I think, I think it's understanding the limitations, but also putting, you know, placing value on, that conversion, and, and we, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head. Anything that can retract, you know, collapse, um, convert, flip, change, you know, curtains and bleachers and all the things that we think about, 
we never, we never remember that at some point someone has to deal with this and you've got to corral a bunch of staff on a regular basis when you forgot that you had a, you know, girls volleyball league coming in that night. It was unfortunately set up for kids camp and you can't, you can't snap from one activity to the next. So I think that's a, that's a really interesting, interesting topic. Jake, I'd like to maybe yeah. ask, you know, this is really kind of to get John's reaction, but I, I think that, you know, and, and and Chris, I know you'll agree to this is like, you know, from an HVAC standpoint, MEP standpoint, like making sure that the systems are designed in such a way that your staff is a comfortable maintaining and be aware of where they're at. Right. Like I, I've, I've had a lot of different conversations with clients over the time. It's where it's like, well, let's get your actual employees in and the maintenance guys and gals and the operations folks so that we can educate them on the final configuration so that, you know, you don't have any downtime from, from a gym because you know it's 150 degrees in there or whatnot or if it's a if it's a series of pre-function rooms to create that grand space you know where they know where all the vav boxes are at and all the controls are, you know how to ha handle all that i think that's a really important part that as architects we're responsible for implementing at a high level absolutely i know storage and you know those back of house aren't always the most exciting things but they're obviously very important for the facilities other things such as, you know, how cash is being handled um, in a facility, things that should be considered early, how, how trash is taken out, how deliveries are coming. I know I've seen a lot of facilities or some facilities that are out there that, you know, have the challenge of having four fronts of a building. And, you know, it's, it's great that there's that much exposure, but that can also be a challenge in the same way when it comes to the design. Well, great. I think we touched on, you know, the importance of versatility and especially in the court spaces. And, you know, we oftentimes talk about programming for a Tuesday and making sure that we have the versatility um, to do so. So what are some of the things in the design that allow, you know, these spaces to be very versatile and flexible? You know, whenever you think of any space, whether it's a meeting room or a gymnasium or a field house or, or any, I mean, we always think, you know, build, build, buildings can be so multi-use and I'll coin this little phrase, that they become multi-useless, right? They, they, they aren't doing anything optimally. They're, they're doing everything partially well. And it's driven by things like flooring choices and acoustics and, you know, all the things that is their queuing spaces, their adequate storage to adapt a meeting room to an aerobic studio or to have a gym convert from a basketball program to a pickleball program. And so, you know, to me, it's not only just understanding how to make something multi-use, it's understanding how can you then make it sort of this seamless transition. Um, and, and I think the key to that is, is having a designer that understands, all right, let's put a matrix together and let's line up all the activities and let's put down their specific requirements. And then let's try to figure out what are those trigger points to say, all right, this room's just doing too much. We need to either duplicate it, replicate it, or offload that activity to another part of the building. I mean, that's, that's sort of the crux of this is to say at what point does a space sort of reach its limits? And then you can start having those conversations about, well, this is the best way to design this space, whether it's a material decision, an equipment decision, queuing, storage, visibility, access to the outdoor, future expansion, all the things you're gonna ask and, and sort of put to rest so that you can walk away five years down the road operating that building and go, yeah, we, we got it right. Because I think to the point earlier when someone made it, you know, you, you kind of get one bite at this apple. You can't come back and revise a space like a gym and, and fix a poor decision if you organized it wrong from the, from the get-go. I, I think that's, Chris, I think that's well said. And, and you know, the, I, the only thing I would add is, you know, I think marketability, right? Like everyone says, well, how's this thing used on a Tuesday? Well, we can program, do everything Chris just said, which is brilliant, but we got to get that out to the community. The community has to know that it's available for pickleball on Tuesday, right? So like, I think it's, it's, it's all part of that project team to kind of help the owner craft the message and the deliverables and the marketing collateral, because, you know, I think rentability only relies on marketability, right? Like if, 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 if you can only rent it if somebody knows it's available and, you know, who it's available for. And we have, and we have clients that, that that is the, you know, when we talk about priorities and what they want to see is they want me to categorize what my local community usage is, what my, what my, you know, parks and rec usage is and what my pay to play usage is. So they want to know what that mix is and that, and that dynamic. Okay. Because they're very in tune to keeping the, you know, people, people voted for things like this to happen, especially if you're municipality operated. 
And so, you know, they can't lose their constituents over the fact that I'm driving only, you know, tournament level pay to play. So, you know, all those metrics have to be um, thought at, considered and, and addressed. You know, I want to talk about some of the innovative things that might be happening out there in, in the world of sports facilities. And I, I want to hear from this group on what, what they're seeing as far as trends and new innovations in some of these facilities that are coming out of the ground. Well, you know, I mean, I'll start with the, the kind of the easy one. It's the inclusion of content media technologies, you know, the, 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 the adaptability to, for, for technology and esports and computer labs and you know, the civic aspect where, you know, some of these buildings are in the areas in the inner youth that, that you know, that don't have that accessible to them. So, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's, you know, my, my, I have a six-year-old boy and I can't get him to quit playing video games and watching people play video games. And, you know, that's a real thing that, that, you know, I mean, if my daughter who is athletic, you know, is at a soccer camp, you know, I mean, there should be something that's meaningful for my son to do too. And, and, you know, it's just expediting and, and accelerating. So, you know, looking at our facilities and, and figuring out a way where broadcast and, and you know, it, it innovative, you know, broadcast media and content media components can be plugged in that also broaden your sponsorship and your marketability, you know, outside of it. It's even, you know, being able to create partnerships that if you have, you know, like if you have a medical partner that's part of your facility, there should be, you know, a back, you know, connection where at that other facility, there's, you know, there's, there's, advertisement and content media in that facility broadcast and then promoting your current facility. So I think just kind of going back and forth, you know, making sure that, the, you know, all of the partners are, are, co are wired together physically um, uh, is, is, is pretty interesting. And I think, I think one of the things that drives, and you mentioned technology and sports and makerspace and innovation centers and all these things, and what they're really being driven by is this, is this, under 30 generation that is now, you know, they're going to become our future users. And they're, they are, they're commanding the world in an entirely different way than anyone has before them. I mean, they, they want things to happen fast. They, they expect constant innovation and change the, you know, this whole idea that access is the new purchase. It's not about what you own. It's about what you're smart enough not to own. It's, you know, they value experience, not things. They, you know, they, they, they're completely kind of turning on the ear what we do as architects because they just don't have the patience for us to sort of figure out and build something and hope it's going to work when they've already moved past that idea onto something new. So, I mean, they're space curators, right? They, they expect buildings to be these like serendipity machines that they can just come in and change and adapt and move the seating around and, you know, plug in somewhere and, I mean, it's kind of interesting to think about it. I, I think in terms of like, if you put yourself in the eyes of this new group of users, they want so much out of our buildings that it's almost like for us as a group to kind of guess at what their trends are. is mm -hmm. sort of a fool's errand. Um, mm -hmm. Other than, you know, understanding that it needs to adapt and change and have access to, to technology and, and, and be able to create and make and innovate and you know, I think, I think that's really the new wave. And, and frankly, I think it's even bleeding into older generations and the way they perceive the world and perceive our building. So I know these aren't specific trends, but they sort of set up the framework by which we think about things like Ninja Cross and we think about an esports or a robotics lab or a, a makerspace where you can have you know, kids come in and, and create things that most of us couldn't even imagine. I think, you know, it's going to make architects obsolete pretty soon because they're, they're doing things in our building we can't even imagine. I mean, we're having, we have projects where we've got, you know, indoor hydroponics and they're growing. We've got projects where, you know, all of a sudden outdoor activity is huge. So it's a bike shop and a, and a, and a place to work on your gear. And, you know, it's a place to store because you've got an apartment that's so small, you don't trust your $4,000 bike locked up to the, to the, to the gate. Um, so, I mean, we're, we're seeing things that we would have never guessed in buildings. And, and I, I agree. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's exciting. I mean, that's, that's the trends we're seeing is, is buildings that are becoming a little bit more. Well, they're somewhat automated. Yeah. I mean, cause they have to, yeah. They have, I mean, to, they have, they have to, to kind of just, yeah. They have to like, like, like they have to like sell like a shop or speak like a magazine or, you know, share like an app. They have to, they have to, they have to do everything. They have to entertain. 
they have to immerse you. They, you know, or, or we're just we're done with this. We're bored. And we're going to move on. We're gonna, I'm going to hop on my lime. I'm going to ride somewhere else. Or I'm going to take an Uber. If and, it's not Instagrammable, you, know, if you can't with, have a Instagram moment in your building. Then uh, if, yeah, if I can't take a, a, a you know a cool little a little TikTok at the front entry with my friends, then I'm going to go down the street to something else. And I, and I think it's important that you know, even if the client may not be able to afford what we anticipate in the next five years, to at least have the back end infrastructure. We've all been in the building and, and, and design industry for a long, long time and, and know that by rule of thumb to retrofit something is three times more expensive or four times more expensive than thinking about it on the, on, on the front end. They may, so, you know, whether it's putting that box or putting that fiber or putting that, you know, dead end to, the, to think about the future are really, really important things from the operation side. You may not be thinking about it today. You may be wanting to do A, B, and C, but I guarantee you in five years, you may need to, you know, it's like, it's like the evolution of a computer. It's obsolete, in, you know, a year after you buy it, but, you know, you, you have to be thinking about the next version, the next plan, the next generational aspect, because you're right, you know, what's, what's here today will not be like tomorrow, you know, and so how do, how do we convince an owner that it's wise to, you know, build for the future versus building for today? future casting and forward thinking. I mean, I would say, I mean, not to, not to sort of steal the, the, the thunder of the room here, but, you know, I would say that also really drives us toward this idea of living design, right? This idea of inclusivity and resilience and sustainability and all these things that tell us that buildings need to be different. Um, you know, they have to, they have to sort of understand or have an awareness or an empathy for all users experience in a building and then understand how those users, I mean, if they're sensitive to certain things or or there's certain adaptabilities that we need to think about, or, you know, again, in certain communities, the sort of resilience to some of the factors, whether they're cultural, social, environmental, um, you know, I think that also kind of gets to that idea that buildings aren't just brick and mortar anymore. They, they kind of have a life and a, and a, yeah. and a, and a sort of a, a use of their own and, um, I think that's probably the other thing we're seeing in, as a huge trend is this kind of trend toward, you know, gender equitable restrooms. I don't think it's unusual to think in many years we won't have men's and women's locker rooms where we shower and change together. We'll have individual rooms and cabanas or, you know, do we have buildings that are completely off grid and net zero? And um, I would hope that those are things that, you know, we're thinking about. They aren't spatial or functional or operational or, you know, um, program uses, but they, I think, impact um, the user's perception of a building almost as much. So, so John, as you know, an operator, I know it's changed the way that the buildings operate. How, how do you see the impact of COVID and both the operations and design of facilities move forward? Well, I think that, you know, um, first and foremost, surfaces, you know, um, need to match the ability to do things like we had to resort to doing with COVID is, you know, how you clean a flat surface, what that flat surface is to be able to clean it. Are you carpet oriented or are you, are you uh, stained, car, uh, stained concrete oriented? You know, all those things that lend yourself to reacting to what some of the things we had to react with in a pandemic um, are all things that, you know, you can't keep in your radar, you know, um, because uh, as well as safety and overall emergency action plans and the safety of the clientele we're, we're in a world environment now, which um, none of us would have anticipated 20 years ago. Um, but we, we have to know that at the end of the day, we have camera systems, monitoring systems, back-end systems to protect our clients and protect um, our fans and protect our operations folks, you know, because any, anymore, you just can't turn a blind eye to things that could happen, you know, whether it's from a threat assessment standpoint to a pandemic standpoint to just an angry parent standpoint. I, I think people's personal space is going to have permanently grown just a little bit. You know, you know like, 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 you know, you go to an urban environment and people's personal space is just a little tighter. People are just a little more comfortable being a little closer together. I think people are gonna act a little more like a, a, someone in a more rural environment. Their, their perception of it. And, and I think that's gonna impact things like, you know, from an architect standpoint, things like locker room size. And, you know, are you comfortable being body to body with people or, a, or a, a group exercise studio where you want just a little bit extra room so that someone's, you know, sweat isn't flicking over on you. I mean, just, just little things that I think people's perception is gonna change where I'm just not comfortable with that person three feet from me. I want them five feet. 
and how does that change space and organization? Yep. You know, we're going to have two-way hallways forever. I don't know. We have arrows on the floor. I bet you in 10 years, you'll go into a facility and they'll still have the arrows taped to the floor that they have. Scraped <laughs> off. That'll, be, that'll be interesting. <laughs> well, I think what's, what, what is right about that is, you know, the, there will be, there'll be two sides of that coin. There will be people who will always want a couple extra space. And then the people who just, just resort right back to what we were. Yep. Right. So, you know, our facilities need to, you know, be the hybrid between that. I think that, you know, the food and beverage as we knew it is gone. You know, I think, I think that, you know, the, it'll always for a very long time be in a bag. Hey, I get a burger and a, whatever it's in a bag, it's prepackaged, it's handed. Um, you know, and I also think that the way that we handle all those multi, you know, multi spaces, like, you know, the locker rooms, the wet areas, and, you know, the, the areas where, restrooms you know in my 20 plus years i've never had a client now granted i've never done a museum but i've i've never had a client says hey you know the six thousand units we have in this building why don't you make them the nicest restrooms you've ever seen right like so you know looking at the materiality of the you know of the you, you know the screens the phenolic resin screens and the surface areas that people touch and you know are, are you really going to you know have to open every single door that you walk through you know i think you know automation becomes very, yeah. very important. You know, I, I've always been an advocate of cashless systems and in, in other venues. And now that's really kind of the going rate everywhere. And so, you know, kind of reducing the touch to points so that it's it's not perceived as like awkward to other people. It's just more convenient, right? And and it's a social, you know, it's a it's a it's a socially responsible thing for us to do is provide our owners and the clients opportunities okay, you know, here's, here's your three opportunities, you know, yes, this costs a little bit more, but look what we did. We saved, Chris saved all these hallways. So now we have all this program back to the building so that we can put that money in a more, uh, more uh, cost-effective scenario. On behalf of the sports facilities companies, I want to thank all of our panelists for, for participating. I think there was some great conversation regarding the design of indoor uh, amateur and youth sports complexes. Um, and, want to appreciate or want to thank everybody for tuning in and uh, for, for your time here today.